Horror games are really weird if you think about it. We purposely make ourselves scared just to make our hearts beat faster. Why? Just to get that boost of an adrenaline rush, you like how certain horror games are designed, everyone you love left you so you have a hole in your heart making you lonely to the point nothing feels you joy so you purposely scare yourself to feel something, anything at all. <sighs> or even just because you want to scream for a bit. Everyone's reason for playing horror games is different. For me, it's just because the nostalgia I grew up with, as most YouTubers I watched when I was younger, such as PewDiePie and Markiplier, blew up playing these kinds of games. Now, honestly, horror as a genre is a pretty hit or miss topic, and recently, a lot of the times, there are quite a bit of misses. Since many of the horror aspects within these new games just seem repetitive and kind of unoriginal. Near the year 2014, we had quite a few games that I loved and genuinely scared me when they first came out. Games such as Outlast, Amnesia, Slender Day 8 Pages, and this funny little bear character that I talked about quite a bit on my channel. Now, from my understanding, most horror games didn't try using quote unquote cute characters to make the player scared. Silent Hill 3 used Robbie the Rabbit, which was a pretty unique thing to do at that time. Now, every other horror game that's become popular in recent years is associated with mascot horror, so this kind of thing became bland. However, earlier examples of this weren't that widely used within horror. That is where we finally make it to Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion, October 24th, 2014. This weirdly adorable, horrifying experience was published. Hello everybody, I'm the Insomniac, and today we're going to be talking about this amazing game from the past. To describe this game in one sentence, it's basically a love letter to all of horror. Not just horror games, but horror as a concept, from movies, books, games, and everything in between. I'll explain this in more detail as we make our way deeper within this mansion that we find ourselves in. There are two versions of this game, so this video is going to be talking about the HD renovation version. The main difference that you need to know is that one just has better graphics and models for the monsters. So, for a better viewing experience for you all, that is why I'm designed to use this one instead of the original. There are slight gameplay differences, but most of them are just to balance the game better. Who we are doesn't matter, we're just some explorer who wants to find out why this mansion is here so we enter inside. That is where we find this adorable ghost named Spooky, who says that this place is our home, telling us to make it through 1000 rooms before basically admitting that she doesn't really know if there's an end to it all. What I love about this game already is it tries to basically make the player fall for a false sense of security, using a cute non-threatening character to introduce the game, while throwing in slight comedic elements to make sure we don't know what waits us in the future. Of course, since most of the people who play this game probably use Steam to get it, you'd probably know that this is specifically labeled as horror. Though disappointment may first hit people when we talk about the first specimen. Basically, how we progress in this game is we walk through a door which leads us to a couple already generated rooms. Now the rooms ordered themselves are completely random, but the locations that we put in are not. It's a mixture of bedrooms, these weird abyss locations that basically are a maze, jail rooms, and much more. These rooms you could think of as fillers since they hold almost no importance at all, other than to slow down the player. Now, as you're walking around in these rooms and hallways, you will sometimes meet the first specimen. The monsters in this game aren't actually labeled as monsters, but instead as numbered specimens, which I'll explain why much later on. So imagine playing this game for the first time and walking around seeing this cardboard cutout pop out of nowhere. I will admit, the first time that this happened, I did jump since there was a loud sound and with how unexpected this thing was, it really caught me off guard. You're walking around in basically empty halls and rooms with absolutely nothing to chase you, not knowing what you're actually supposed to do other than to make it to room 1000. So when nothing happens, your expectations are lowered and lowered once again until you somehow get scared by this cardboard cutout of a cartoon skeleton or slime or spider and I hate that I actually got scared by you for a second. Anyways, the beginning of this game is important because it messes with the player's perception and expectations of this game. Most horror games try to do the exact opposite, filling with fear with multiple jump scares that only progressively get worse and worse as the games progress. There are some that try to lower your guard, but not many did it by using cute character designs like Spookies. So when you're going through the first few rooms and notice the only real jump scare to happen was this pumpkin then you might assume that this game was possibly a horror game for children, 
and not a real horror game. Now, each specimen is something we could actually read about in this cat DOS terminal, which talks about their kill count and giving a description of what it is. Surprisingly, four whole people died because of the cardboard cutouts, with their main method of attack being a heart attack. <laughs> I have no idea how anyone could ever get scared by this thing. Ahaha. <laughs> Yeah, anyways, it basically says that they're not very effective against healthy subjects. The word effective is going to be quite important to remember for later on. These things by themselves are not that bad to deal with since they just pop up, but it's important to note that they will never disappear and will always pop up no matter where we are in the game. That by itself is okay, but if we're running away from something and they pop up, they will make your character stop for a second. This single second could be extremely bad for us in the future. As we make it further, we will find these notes lying around. The first person these notes belong to is simply called the Romantic Victim. Either we are Usain Bolt sprinting down these halls at record speed, or this person is unbelievably slow because we aren't even at 100 rooms in yet, as they talk about being extremely thirsty. Leaving these notes around to basically make sure that they're making progress and not going in circles. At one point, even drinking ink to quench the thirst? I don't think I need to explain why that's a bad idea. <laughs> that is when they find a bottle of red wine that tastes metallic. Yeah, the same red wine that vampires drink if you get what I'm saying. On room 300, you could actually meet up with them as a skeleton. But at least they look like they passed away in style with their hat and pen in hand. This is just another example of this game putting in comedic elements within the beginning to come off as more tame. This is also probably the last time I talk about anyone that isn't a monster since it would take too much within the short review of the game. Now things quickly change with the sight of the second specimen. The sound effect from this thing is absolutely horrifying and I love it, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Room 60 is where we find this room that has this weird thing on the floor. This green slime will slow us down when we walk over it, so it also works kind of like a mini tutorial as people will most likely try walking over it to see what it does. Walking forward, we will find this note which has some nonsense like spouting, splashing, soaking, Oh look, it's the same letters as SIN, C-I-N. It says SIN, get it? Because it's creative? Haha. <laughs> this is honestly pretty clever since the background story about this monster is really deep and lore heavy. So basically, SIN represents how the creation of the slime monster was rooted in- I'm just lying. The word SIN has absolutely nothing to do with the plot and is honestly just there to be edgy. Once we read this note, however, we will hear this. That is when we are chased by the first real enemy in the whole game, who we will refer to as Gel, mostly due to it actually being made of gel. It has no eyes, no legs that it seems to be floating, and always open mouth, with the scariest feature about him being that he's absolutely, completely, undoubtedly, bald. I like how this thing is introduced as we have to read this note and all of a sudden hear a creepy raspy voice behind us only for us to have to suddenly start running room to room with this green jelly on the ground trying to slow us down. It really is one of the best introductions to a monster since before this point there was absolutely no signs of any hostile creatures around us. Though the monster itself is quite boring to me. It doesn't really do anything crazy and its design isn't that interesting either since it looks like a green ghost that has a big mouth. In the cat DOS terminal, it has a total of 137 fatalities with it being most effective against weaker or slower subjects. Now this is where we begin talking about the death scenes after each specimen which will vary from how good it is. This gel monster will claw us until our health reaches zero, and when that happens, it will expand, growing eyes and another mouth with the text, I know what you have done and what you have yet to do, but it's alright because I am inside you now. We are one, but I am many. At least take me out to dinner first, damn. Honestly, for the first monster, this is 
underwhelming, and it's probably one of the worst death scenes within the whole game. Its chase theme is called Unknown Hug, so I guess it's like a hive mind that attempts to grow by absorbing other people. I'm not sure, I just always assume slime monsters absorb things to get bigger in games, but that's just my theory. Anyways, most of the specimens are also references to other franchises, and in this case are a clear callback to Lub Glubs that appear in Adventure Time. These things were pretty scary to me as a kid, so I can at least appreciate this, but I still find its design to be quite lacking compared to the others that we will talk about. After a few rooms or so of you being chased by a specimen, they will disappear and you will have to go back to your usual descent. However, they don't technically disappear completely, as every single one will come back later randomly. It's kind of a pretty nice way to make sure you don't forget the older monsters as they will constantly come back to haunt you even if you leave their quote unquote areas. And trust me, the future special areas change the game quite drastically in a way that made me go from kind of enjoying this game to falling in love with it. This is around the time we will finally reach the elevator which happens around every 100 rooms or so, but the number changes after a while. While in this elevator, there will be various motivational posters of an adorable character on it, with this place to save the game. It's kind of an area for you to take a breather after being constantly chased all game. I always like this kind of feature within horror games since we'll usually be chased, hunted down, scarred, jump scared all game, but once you reach these safe spaces, we will finally be able to really digest everything that's happened so far. It's kind of a bad game design to make the whole game filled with jump scares and constant fears since eventually it will make everything so boring and honestly repetitive. But having an area like this to cause the player's heartbeat to normalize for a bit letting them relax, and mentally have a reset back to a state where they could finally be scared again is actually pretty nice. Room 120 is where we get to meet our actual first area. That completely changes everything. This will be a recurring theme of new specimens being introduced within a whole different place. And this is the point where I actually started to love this game like I said previously. We go from the normal halls into this metallic room with industrial lights. It's obvious that this place is very different from the rest. Looking around, we will find these green test tubes in the walls showing various creatures that are pretty weird, with one clearly broken open. Next to a pile of ketchup is this note left by generic lab assistant. If you couldn't tell, this game isn't trying to take itself seriously at all. <laughs> In it, they say Subject 5 is growing more and more restless. I told Spook that we need more funding for sedatives, but she just laughed and flew into the ceiling. Without more chemicals to keep those things docile, I'm not sure how much longer we can keep these things safely. I love how that sounds exactly what Spooky would actually do in that kind of situation. After this, we pick up this key card and move on our way. Next to another pool of ketchup, we find this other note. I believe subject 5 is loose. The glass around this container is shattered and I can faintly hear clicking coming from the ceiling. I don't know what will happen now. If it is out and alive, then this is probably my last report. The clicking is getting louder now. After putting that as a note, we will immediately begin getting chased by this centipede looking thing that honestly would probably make a good pet. I mean, as long as we fed it and kept it happy, I'm sure there wouldn't be any issues. Now, I actually really like the introduction of this specimen since it generally was built up pretty well. We know that there was a test tube missing a subject, so there was something out there and the sudden change of atmosphere was pretty well made as well. Like I said before, once we encounter a specimen and outrun it, it will show up multiple times afterwards to chase us again. We'll always know when this thing is after us when the holes are in the ceiling, since it will crawl down to hunt us. Design wise, if you had a fear of spiders or insects, this thing will probably be your nightmare coming to life. I mean, just the constant clicking sounds it produced when running after you was honestly nerve wracking by itself and I don't even mind spiders all that much. Unless it's tarantulas, but those things shouldn't exist. The death scene for it was also something else. It will give you a little hum before backing away and then coming back to give you another nibble which just shows that this thing is just a tsundere. After accidentally bringing your HP to zero, we'll wake up next to his nest, which, let me be honest, the amount of holes in the ceiling made me feel quite weird for some reason. I forgot the word that describes holes making it uncomfortable, but that's what I felt in that moment. 
I don't think it was the holes themselves, but the fact that there could be multiple versions of this thing crawling around and reproducing, that made me terrified for a minute. I'll just let this cutscene play out before talking about it. So basically, what I'm understanding is that this thing is just a single mother of what I'm assuming is two kids and simply wants the best meal for them. She's just trying to do her best to provide, I can't really fault her for that. But seriously though, this death scene is really well designed with the slow increase of the specimens showing up as well as the clicking sounds increasing and getting louder. Gel just felt boring and if they're somehow your favorite character, which I doubt, leave a comment down below on why. The centipedes though, not only had a better introduction, but also added some lore into what was going on within his mansion. It's not much, but we now know that for some reason, that there were people working within his lab, either creating or experimenting on these monsters. For what purpose is currently unknown, but Spooky herself seems to be working directly with those scientists, who I'm guessing are completely gone due to those centipedes. The scariest part about this death scene for me is that we don't actually know how many there are currently. At first, we assumed that there was only one since there was only one test tube shattered, but in the death scene, there was actually three. Assuming that it could now reproduce, though we don't know how fast, there could be dozens or even hundreds more that we don't even know about. At least now, I could go to sleep happy knowing that there'll be at least one I could take home with me as a pet. The cat DOS screen shows they only had 43 fatalities with the method of attack being infectious bites. This would explain why it would bite you, then run away, since it knows that its bite most likely has some sort of venom inside of it. Though, this is never actually implemented within the game. It was developed by this place called GL Labs, showing that it was effective towards average subjects. Basically saying it's a good guard dog to have. Corpse Party was released on March 8th, 2008, and this was a game that I had a lot of memories with, mostly due to watching my favorite creators overreact while playing it. It left quite a large impression on me since as a kid going through middle school around that time, what if there was a ghost within my own school? I'm sure many of you could relate creating fake scenarios in your head like saying I would definitely survive if I ever entered an alternative dimension full of ghosts, since obviously I would be the main character. Why am I suddenly bringing this game up? Well, back to the mansion, we continue walking around until we make it to room 160, which made me panic a little. The environment completely changes and all we are left with is a dark school with the only source of light that we have being this flashlight that we suddenly brought with us I think? The geo labs we were in definitely felt different since it was within a testing facility but could definitely fit within this game's aesthetic. This place however, did not. It was completely unfathomable how quickly they decided to change the setting. Catching players off guard like this is definitely something this game is really amazing at, which only gets better from this point on, slowly increasing how effective these new introductions are. This was a place I truly felt afraid in. There was no sounds except for the mind-numbing ambience with the only sounds truly there being our footsteps and the opening of these doors. Expanding why I really love the design choice of suddenly switching to an empty school, not only did I have a lot of fond memories of Corpse Party, but I do also enjoy watching a lot of creepy content in my free time. One such topic are those who explore abandoned areas. These places range from hospitals, various homes, usually those who have someone pass away in them, tragically, but some of the creepiest ones has to be the abandoned schools. I'm not talking about the obvious clickbaity OMG there was some scary encounter that was definitely not staged kind of videos or the haunted place gone wrong. Those are very boring and obviously just there for views. The kind of videos I enjoy are much more laid back and explore the creepy emptiness of a location. 
You don't need loud sounds or some stranger chasing you to make these kinds of places scary. Sometimes, just the stillness of a location seemingly eroded through time being explored by someone years or even decades in the future can be enough to cause a feeling of uneasiness to the viewer. This was a place for children to learn that many people had similar schools structured just like it, with lockers, classrooms, books, and a gym, but now? All there is is trash and the decaying messes left behind. It kind of feels wrong to enter a place like this, especially after you graduated from a school of similar design, giving you thoughts like, is that what my own school will look in years time? Either that, or this looks like the original Slenderman game due to the limited flashlight, so who knows, maybe I'm delusional. One of those is probably why this place makes me so creeped out. There are also these weird shadows or ghosts near the desks of this place, which will attack us if we get too close. So kind of like a school in real life with people attacking you for no reason. Enough talking about this location, let's talk about Ringu, who is probably one of my favorites in this entire game. Design only though. The base game's design is far better in my opinion because uh... Yeah? Boo! They kind of changed her. Let's talk about the original first. She's basically the stereotypical ghost, but that's all she really needs to be to be effective. Having ghostly pale skin, black hair, and ketchup fingers. She should probably wash her hands off after eating all those Mickey D's. With all of this, it's honestly a pretty well-rounded design, except you where she's coming from. I might also really love this design because I kind of had this thing for ghost girls when I was younger. You were watching the ring or the grudge feeling terrified, while I, being a 10 year old, was having a hard time simping for these two. I have no idea what's wrong with me either. I blame Sam, Raven, Shigo, Marceline, and the Hex Girls for making me this way. The Hex Girls are heavily underrated by the way, please bring them back. The H3 3D model remake added static and lines which is most likely to be a reference to the ring ghost since they came out of a TV. I could appreciate this and although I do enjoy the base design better, the second design definitely had a lot more terrifying elements to it, with it looking like it came out from an old TV frame. Fun fact, the number 4 is considered really bad luck in Japanese culture since it's pronounced similar to the word death. The wiki says it's just a coincidence but I like to believe that it's not. Since she is a ghost, she will float through doors, walls, and even holes, while the previous creatures couldn't do that, and would need to walk around places. The main locations where you could just sprint through, you would now need to take your time since she could just walk in a straight line towards you. Isn't that fun? She also sings and talks to us. The chase scene music is called Breakfast is too late, and this is a pretty clever way of continuing the lore from the two notes left behind in the school. One is talking about how Matsurui, I'm sorry for butchering the name, never came to class today, with the other being how there was a ghost eating children for being late. So what you're telling me is that there was a ghost lady who was literally William Aftoning these children, and I run a mostly FNAF based channel. Can you not see how perfect we are together? If you're a ghost watching this, my room is pretty lonely at night. The actual introduction of her comes when her song comes on when she appears behind you. Going from silence to a sudden chase was definitely weird since the buildup was perfect, though I feel like they could have tried to make her appear in a better way. Maybe let her go through a wall to jump scare you or something other than this since... It felt really anticlimactic. Like, the location was perfect, the atmosphere was definitely there, but she just appears and chases you now. I don't know, maybe my expectations for introductions were set too high after the centipede? I don't know. Anyways, how is her death screen? Well, she was definitely hungry. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? 
You had everything you needed! An amazing atmosphere, the perfect build-up, a really well-made design, and up tons of praises I could've kept on giving you. And this is it? This is the death scene I was getting so excited to see. Me getting bored by a knockoff Ringo's with her saying, Hush now my child, you are safe? If I wanted to see that kind of content, I would've just went on R34. Not playing this! Seriously though, make me scared. Show me something more than just a small animation of her biting me and looking pregnant afterwards. You can't just lead off with the perfect death screen from the centipede and then downgrade like this. I'll be making a tier list at the end of the video of every single death scene, so look forward to that. Now, the cat DOS says that she has a body count of 85. With her method being consumption? Is that 85 kids or just people? <laughs> A 14th century spirit that was relocated to this location, though it is unknown where she's actually from. She doesn't seem to be as effective as her previous specimens for some reason though. Room 210, we once again enter a dark room. But this time, this place gives off a much more eerie feeling that I feel as though is much more effective than the school. Simply put, just listen to the drastic change in sound design. This place is completely metallic with the rust absolutely everywhere. Everything just seems worn down with these rooms that we could get into. Inside, there are these notes that talk about some sort of cult ritual going wrong. This cult was worshipping this person, simply known as Mother, who was getting angry towards the members. The reason why I don't believe it's ever stated? Though it seems that there was a sacrifice these people need to do, but use a girl that wasn't quote unquote, pure. With the emptiness and the sounds of our footsteps hitting the metal, this really was a place that would make your mind play tricks on you if you stayed here for too long. It's when we reach room 212, things quickly change. The darkness is gone and everything is replaced with a bright white area. There is static everywhere as we continue on our path. There's also this room? I'm not even going to attempt to explain whatever that was since there's a lot of things I could say, so let's just continue. After entering the next room, we see Bab coming towards us from this caged corner. I actually like this since we do see the cage being opened when we walk past, making this an event that happens rather than someone just appearing right behind us. Bab herself is a pretty well-made design, with her being completely faceless, all pale, having a feminine looking body. It seems as though her body is made up of some sort of organic material that isn't flesh, such as paper, clay, parchments, or even wood. At least that's what the wiki states. It says that her species is a mannequin, so that just might be speculation. Now this design is heavily, and I mean heavily, inspired by the Silent Hill series. Almost like a mixture between a nurse, pyramid head, and a mannequin. Even the story was extremely similar with some sort of cult accidentally messing up which resembles what happened by the order. Now the gameplay behind probably spoiled it but Bab doesn't just chase you down by walking and busting through doors. It seems that she's actually one of the slowest specimens in the whole game and could easily be evaded. Though, she has this really strange and annoying ability to cause hallucinations. While we're being chased, our vision will be blocked slightly by this thick looking fog, which will be mixed in with the constant changing of the floors, walls, and doors become a different animated texture. To say that this is one of the most annoying gimmicks in the whole game is an understatement. Running around will get annoying if you can't tell where you're actually going, but it's the fact that the door itself will also become distorted, which at points will make it seem like it completely disappeared. We'll come back to this with a future specimen, but for now, just know it's one of the more frustrating abilities to deal with within the entire game. Though when this first happened, it did cause me to over panic and lose sight of where I need to go, which led to a game over screen. I don't do well under pressure, so don't judge me. The sounds this thing makes is just so... weird? At first there's a sound of something metallic, but then it sounds like a living creature? 
If I can make a guess, it's almost like a doll came to life, but not understanding how to talk properly. So it tries to imitate speech while not knowing how to do it. Its sounds and body aren't something I would have linked together, so this kind of threw me off. I would have expected these kinds of sounds from a zombie, not a doll created by a cult. Weird. Its chase music is called Lusting Strawberry. The others had reasons for their names, but I have no idea what this title is supposed to mean. I guess her name is actually Strawberry and she's just chasing us because she's in heat? We all assumed that she was a lifeless doll, but in reality, she was probably a werewolf this entire time. To perfectly describe this chase sequence quickly, I would say that it feels like a really bad trip. With the chase theme, constantly changing colors, and the sound is thing... Growling? Don't know how to describe that sound. Yeah, yeah, you're hungry, we get it. At least, I think you're hungry? I don't know, since it did end 168 people, but the method is unknown, so honestly, probably just William abdens some people without an actual reason. I don't think he eats them after. The description of her is a creature found inside of a church within a small town. The subjects are lost after contact with the specimen, which the current method used being unknown. It's proven extremely effective towards subjects with mental issues or weak wills. Remember that last part for later, since I will be bringing it up again for another specimen. Now it's kind of strange since it might operate similar to the SCP called the Old Man or SCP-106. This SCP grabs people and then pushes them in a pocket dimension where they do spooky things to them. I would talk about the death scene for Strawberry Shortcake here, but so boring to be honest. It's a bunch of cryptic messages about becoming something with a satanic symbol behind it. Oh, at least they have holes in his face area now. That's pretty cool, I guess. All in all, this one is officially the worst death scene so far, since it doesn't really do anything that I find creepy. Ooh, creepy symbols and flashing lights. This is spooky yet. Maybe some of you do enjoy this, but for me, I particularly don't. Continuing forward, we make it to room 250, which is when we get to talk to Spooky again. This is basically a marker for us that we are officially one-fourth done with this game. And oh wow, we are 8 pages into the script and only talked about 5 of the 14 specimens. Oh my god, this is going to take a long time. This small cutscene will appear when we walk in, which generally made me smile when I first saw it. <laughs> I love how adorable this freaky little game is. Anyways, let's make it to the next area. The previous three areas were pretty amazing, but room 310 was something that gave me quite a bit of nostalgia. If you couldn't tell, it's based on a game, The Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask. Walking around, there are no possible doors until we stand in the middle of the room, where we notice that one of the passages allows us to walk past it. In it is this key and these notes. They describe that there was this merchant who sold his puppets and trinkets to the children who lived in his town. Though the other shopkeepers are jealous of his success and decide to throw all of his puppets into the lake. Soon after, he came running saying his children were drowning, which resulted in him trying to save his possessions, but he never came back up. With the second key, we make it to the next area, where we find more information about what happened. Many years later, children would go missing. And then these puppets would be found that looked eerily similar to those that disappeared. Basically, these townsfolk hated this guy who did absolutely nothing wrong, except make these puppets who he loved in order to give to children to make them happy. But this caused him to basically become unallied for no justifiable reason. Call me a bad person, but hey, those townsfolk kind of deserved what happened to them afterwards. I did enjoy the introduction of some of these specimens, but this one has to be one of the far better ones. The merchant is just standing in the middle of the room, not moving, and if you get close to him, he will float up and attack you from behind. I love the clunky animation of him doing this since it felt like a puppet being literally lifted from its strings before being dropped. The reason why I love this introduction so much is how it teaches us about its gameplay mechanics, also making it quite menacing and creepy. Basically, he cannot move when you have eye contact towards him, unless you're dumb enough to walk close enough to be kissing distance away from him. 
So while you're being chased, just simply turn around and walk backwards to make sure he doesn't have to jump on you. Though this only slows him down and doesn't completely stop him in his tracks as he will still move towards you if you stare at him for more than 8 seconds. You'll know when he's after you due to the sound playing as well. I thought about the Minecraft skeleton sounds and I can't unhear it even though I know they're supposed to be wooden sticks. I do enjoy his design, it's simple but he's supposed to be an actual man turned into a puppet so it makes sense. This coupled with how I'm assuming he's actually from an older time period due to there being townsfolk. The outfit is believable as well. All in all, a pretty solid and creepy design mixed in with the backstory that makes you kind of sympathize with him. Either that, or I'm just a horrible person for feeling bad about this guy who potentially was the OG William Afton of his time period. <laughs> Yay! I also do really love the subtle detail of making his choice of weapon being a needle since as a puppeteer, that is most likely what he's most comfortable with using all his life. Now for everyone's favorite part, the death scene and oh wow, was this actually a pretty solid death scene? The anxiety I felt when the needle was slowly nearing our eyes as it was being forced open was thrilling. There was nothing really that graphic shown but this was enough for it to be perfect due to the implication of what happened next. The previous death scenes were admittedly pretty underwhelming but this one was something that actually was gruesome due to how it let the player imagine what happened next. I wish the others had something similar to this. The cat DOS shows that this guy has been putting in some work, having 189 whackings, with his method of attack being physical punctures most likely done with his needle. A wooden life-size puppet found floating in a reservoir where a town had once been, being very effective on subjects who disregarded it or have vision impairments, once again referring to how we need to look at him in order to slow him down. Last thing before we move on, Ben Drowned was one of the first popular creepypastas of the internet that blew up due to its attention to detail. It might as well be a whole novel due to its length since it takes quite a bit of time to finish reading through it all, but I do recommend reading it. While most creepypastas are shorter stories meant to be scary with gore and scary details and shocking information, Ben Drowned creates a whole narrative that I don't think was ever truly replicated ever since at least not as effectively. Basically what I'm trying to say is, The Merchant is based on the story of Ben Drowned, and I love it. I also really love how this game isn't taking inspiration from just older horror games, but also from movies and even creepypastas. So this part might get a little personal and deep, so if you want to skip it, I understand. Things after room 406 is honestly a pretty mind-numbing experience. To say that this area was confusing is an understatement. Most of the previous places had one location, and when we leave that location, we encounter a new specimen. Here though, I'll be calling this place the main character's damaged psyche. It's broken around various different rooms, beginning in rooms 406, 410, 415, and then finally 421. We first make it to 406 which has this threshold of consciousness, which most likely is talking about how we're going to currently enter our own mind for a bit, not knowing that we're also going to be inviting something in the process. Breaking it open, we will make it to the first place in our first meeting with this white cat, which will say some weird cryptic lines when we get close to her, with each room we encounter her in being even more weird than the last. Trying to understand the meaning of each location was difficult. I am just a person who plays horror games for the spooks, not to think about the deeper philosophical reasons on why we exist. Anyways, after some digging, I found this person named Amun Ra 1 who tried to explain what these rooms could have represented. 
which will be important to understand the specimen that's going to be coming up. In it, they talk about how the rooms are a reference to Zhang Ying, psychology. A real life analysis of a person's mind and is essential for a certain form of therapy, focusing mostly on one's personality. Quote, Jung in therapy may be used to treat a wide variety of issues such as depression, destructive relationship patterns, personality patterns such as obsessive compulsive personality, and matters of aging and meaning. While very specific symptoms such as panic attacks or phobias may remit during the process of Jung in analysis, Jung in treatment does not focus exclusively on those symptoms but rather on the development of the personality. With the most important aspect that we should remember about this part being quote, an increasing number of joining analysis treat trauma, integrating practices from other therapies along with joining perspectives. Each of the locations we visit is a reference to the persona, amnia, and aminus, the self, and finally, the shadow. The most important thing we'll be focused on specifically is the shadow concept, since it is what we will most of the time find only in our nightmares. It is an archetype that quote, exists as part of the unconscious mind and is composed of repressed ideas, weaknesses, desires, instincts, and shortcomings. Considering that this is the last location we see before meeting the new specimen, it makes sense due to it being our most repressed. This is a location we don't even want to acknowledge even exists. The white cat is something most assumed was representing some sort of form of a therapist due to them giving advice on how to get better. But I do agree with Amun since they do point out how the cat only shows up once we enter our own consciousness, so it only makes more sense that they are a product of our own mind and could potentially be a defense mechanism against Specimen 7. Now going back all the way to Specimen 5, BAP, it said that they were extremely effective against subjects with mental issues or weak wills. Specimen 7 is essentially just like the wall of flesh from Terraria, moving from one side to the other. But what's interesting is his cat DOS. It ate up 93 people, with its actual method of attack being currently unknown. The specimen is constantly changing forms and attributes depending on the subject's personality, but the most common form resembles a wall of moving anime symbols. Only effective on subjects with past trauma or a history of psychological issues. That while we broke into our consciousness invited the specimen in with us. But it wouldn't be able to do anything to us if we didn't have something in our past or some issue we are currently dealing with haunting us. Our character is a troubled individual, but we don't know exactly why though. We don't know anything about them, not how they look, nor their past. Whatever is weighing them down is allowing certain specimens to hunt them much easier due to some issues. What I'm assuming it could be is either some traumatic event that they can't let go of or even depression. We were told that we were some sort of avid history enthusiast in the beginning of the game, but is this really a reason for us to push through this location after seeing a ghost introduce themselves to us? Do we want to make it through at all? Or are we trying to push ourselves through many different challenges to make sure we want to stay alive, to find a reason that we should still exist even against all odds? This cat isn't a therapist, it's a part of us. We made them inside of our own consciousness to tell ourselves we need to keep going. The first time we meet her, she will say this. This place can help those who are ready, but expect turmoil more than you are used to. We're ready to change ourselves for the better, but it's extremely hard to find out how. And once we reach the shadow, the dark room representing all our repressed feelings, memories, ideas, and everything we think makes us weak, she tells us this. Knowing your shadow can greatly help you, but be ready to see what you'd rather not be. I'm interpreting this in two ways. Either we're going to have to face some sort of traumatic event that happened to us head on by acknowledging that it happened in the past instead of just running away and denying it, accepting that now it's a part of who we are as a person. The second interpretation is that we must accept our flaws as a person instead of hating ourselves for whatever reason we may have. We aren't worthless, even if we may not value ourselves as a person, which is why we're going to have to be ready to see what we would rather not be. Everything in this video is my own personal opinion of what actually happened, so don't just take this as fact. You have your own opinions. 
Entering the next room, we will make it to this dark red location, being slowly chased by this creepy wall of flesh, which I'm assuming are actual skeletons. These are the skeletons in one's closet, the hidden things we don't want to acknowledge and don't want others to view at all. Regrets, trauma, pain, fears, flaws, everything mixed in into one place. It's hard to represent all of these things within one creature, just one entity, which is why the previous area was so perfect to express what the specimen was supposed to be. If this was just one creepy wall moving from one location to the other, it wouldn't be that effective or even as scary to think about since it's relatively slow. Other locations did introduce multiple characters such as the generic scientist and Matsurui, but none introduced a second character in person like the white cat. A perfect monster isn't just a scary design, yes that could help, but to base the fear factor solely on their design is pointless. If that was the case, Specimen 3 to me at least wouldn't be that scary. As someone not really that scared of insects, an overgrown centipede isn't that terrifying design-wise. But couple this with the clicking sounds, how it crawls from the roof towards the player, its death scene, all these things together is what makes it one of the better designs. I especially love the design for Specimen 7 since if it touches you, you won't take damage. It will instantly finish you off. Almost like representing how your past finally got to you not being able to handle anything anymore, and giving in to your past since this wall is moving extremely slowly. I doubt anyone will be able to actually lose this thing, so you most likely had to purposely stand still to lose. There is no actual cutscene like the rest and instead just leads to a game over screen, but I feel as though this thing doesn't really need one due to how much background it has to give to the player. Letting us know that we aren't perfect and we have some sort of thing we cannot let go of, whether it's trauma or mental illness, we do not know, but what we can say for certain is something is up with the player due to his wild flesh affecting us this badly. It seems to be similar to Gygus from Earthbound, who is supposed to be an evil alien who wants to do bad things, so maybe I'm wrong and completely overanalyze this wall, who was just an alien that got flattened into a moving red pancake, who knows. Room 500. We are finally halfway done with the game, aren't you guys excited? Anyways, we meet up with Spooky who sounds extremely happy to see us. Well, here you are, alive and still here. You just keep on going, don't you? Well, the next door has been fixed up for you. So enjoy and keep moving on, you little fleshy live one. But wait, we have to go all the way back to room 500 for some reason since the door was broken. So now we have to go all the way back to room 500 once again by walking room to room. Fun. At least that's what it seems like, but once we make it to the first room we met Mr. Jelen, a new door is shown which will take us to the express tunnel and back to room 510. The little quirky changes this game does so it doesn't feel bland or repetitive is honestly pretty fun to see. Room 550 is something that is every gamer's worst nightmare. It causes the player to actually touch grass for the first time. For all the League of Legends players watching, you could use a timestamp down below to skip this section. Just in case you can't handle seeing the outside world for this long. I like how this section purposely throws a player off since this is the first time we'll be anywhere that isn't in an enclosed space, putting us within this foggy forest and making us walk through cabins to make it back within the mansion. We find a note talking about this person who tried to sneak up on a deer for food, but well, these deer are pretty adorable, but not exactly friendly and will attack you if you get too close to them. This is the time where we finally unlock everyone's favorite weapon. The axe. Something we can actually swing around and sometimes even injure the specimens that chase us down. But most of the time, it usually doesn't do much to really hurt them nor slow them down. More on this later though. You could kill the deer, but there are so many of them that it's just honestly easier to run straight to the exit. We then make it to this dark area with these walls that have this weird pattern to them. Once we get this key and make it to the final section, this happens. <laughs> Is 
He doesn't come from behind you. He's extremely direct with his approach, walking straight towards you in a straight line. This thing is such a perfect design from his height, which I think is probably the tallest thing we've encountered so far, not including the wall of flesh and centipede. The cloak he wears to hide his skeletal remains inside of him, plus the screaming faces which I think are the souls he stole. And the disturbing white eyes that stare directly at you. I won't lie, a lot of designs I enjoy the original games much better, which is why I usually show them when describing the specimens. But the new changes just works for him in such a menacing way. While the other specimens definitely do say some lines while chasing you, most usually just some laugh or making some inaudible scream. But this thing? This thing is straight up taunting you while chasing after you, which just makes the thing even more terrifying. Your flesh will sustain my children. Your submission is inevitable. Why do you run, child? So, for introductions, it definitely was up there, especially with the dark hallway walking towards you directly, which was something you would have never expected, making it absolutely horrifying. So, you know how we had that ghost before who could basically float over things and, you know, go through walls? Well, this thing is basically a ghost. Except much worse, because if there's a wall between you and them, you will literally just face through it quickly, and the animation of it is absolutely brilliant. Is if you look at it closely, you'll notice it's actually a portal dimension with trees that it uses to get close to you, making it one of the scariest things to run away from due to the abundance of rooms that have turns around it. Not only that, every time we get hit, these images pop up on screen, which only causes you to panic even more. So, with the great design, horrifying game elements, how is this dead screen? Surely, that's probably D tier, right? Right? This was genius. You get teleported to a whole new area with these trees and a dark red sky. The same location that it uses to face through walls. The best part about this, in my opinion, is that you, the player, are walking towards him. He is simply standing at the end of the path, just waiting for you, knowing that there is no way out of this. This coupled with his white eyes staring down at you with his imposing height makes this such an amazing scene and I wish other specimens had similar scenes in theirs. Not dragging you in another dimension since that would get boring, I mean adding more depth since a lot of them just had one picture or small animation plus some lines of text to make it ooh look spooky. This though doesn't need any text or anything like that at all. Just you walking towards him accepting your fate. That's what makes it one of the best in the whole game. The cat DOS entry for him is particularly interesting. He consumed 149 people with his method of attack being absorption, which was probably foreshadowed by the souls under his robe. It seemed that he was one of those violent deers at first, but it evolved somehow. But the thing that was most interesting was that it was proven extremely effective on violent subjects. Huh. Yes, you can actually unalive the deer after picking up the axe, but even if you don't, you will still meet this thing. Going back to the previous specimen, what if the thing we were repressing was due to how we acted towards other people, or even to a specific person? But that's just a theory. Oh, why am I trying to make sense of this game from 2014 theory? <laughs> this deer lord was inspired by the beast from Over the Garden Wall, and the forest was also coming from that cartoon. So that's pretty cool. With the Wendigo, not that one, yep, that one, being another form of inspiration for it as well. 
Now, the next specimen is something we don't get to meet yet. We're just going to have to wait a bit more before we actually get to it. So, this thing wants to go before specimen 9, I guess. Room 610 is where we get another dark section. To spike up my anxiety even more. This place seemed to be GL Labs, but the older version of the previous one we found. Which is weird because it seems to have a lot more advanced technology, especially with the tablets. I think that's what they are. Being the notes here instead of just paper notes that we saw originally. Someone discovered this location before we did, and it seems that nothing here is working like originally intended. Then, after clicking this button, the lights work, and these doors, which are pretty fun to use, are now functioning. We then find a second note saying some of the equipment isn't working, almost as if it was designed for people without hands. With there also being sounds coming from the air ducts. I wonder, where we met a creature that crawls through a vent that was within a lab? Who knows? Anyways, continuing on our journey, we make it to this room where the power goes out and we have to go through this air duct. I hate and love sections like this, with the tight feeling of needing to crawl through the area while also only having a flashlight to see anything. It's so confining and really makes you start to worry when something is really going to start chasing you here. The next note we find talks about Spooky said there were some things that they need to salvage from this place, with a specimen probably being part of that list, with the power shutting off constantly. Once again, we need to go through this vent in order to find another note. It seems they found whatever that thing was and is hiding from it. Though they feel like something is growing on their skin as well now. Something we probably need to remember. The final note we find says we need to keep it close since it becomes something else if we get too far from it. Which is when this happens. Like the note says, you can't run away too far from this thing since it will transform into some sort of worm that is faster than you and will infect you. I actually like this concept though in practice, it honestly is more annoying than it is terrifying. But I can understand what they were going for. When you get close to it, it will open its stomach revealing a mouth that will go hum nom 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 if you get too close. But you can't run too far since like I said, it will beast boy it up, turning into a worm that will outrun you. As a person who's obsessed with holding shift in games, I pump stamina in Skyrim just because I hate walking anywhere and need to run. It's more satisfying gliding all over the place and slowly pacing around. Basically, it's the thing from... The Thing. That's what the movie is called. The Thing. I wish it actually had a name because that could get confusing. But it's a space parasite which is why this thing looks like a melted version of a person. What I like about the specimen is the fact that it's not even supposed to be the original specimen 10, since it's supposed to be this worm, eel, thing? Though in an update, they decided to take it out and just say a space parasite ate it up instead, which I think was for the better since we already had a centipede so another crawly monster in a lab would have honestly just been kind of redundant. I don't know why, but when it opens its mouth, it kind of reminds me of the amnesia monster for some reason. Even though they look nothing alike, maybe it's just the mouth, I couldn't tell you why, but it did make me like the design quite a bit. For the introduction though, I quite liked it as a fake out for the, whoa this worm thing is the monster that's hunting you down, only for it to be revealed that it was actually a parasite inside of it. Spooky. It definitely threw me off guard, so extra points for that. Now, how is its actual death scene? Well, honestly, it's the absolute worst one yet. Solid area, with the dark places and vent which was definitely something I enjoyed crawling through since it made my heart race a bit, and even had a good introduction. But this thing is just a bunch of flashing lights and text that I don't really care for. I get it's a parasite trying to control your mind and influencing how you really think, but really? This just seems boring to use text to make this part scary. Don't get me wrong though, the idea that a parasite could literally control your brain is terrifying to me. If you think about it, you would literally lose all self-control and just be a shell of your former self. That kind of concept is horrifying. But here, flashing lights and text is just... After the previous specimen, it's an absolute downgrade and a disappointment. It's cat Dot says it has 245 successes. Wow, that's a high number for this thing. 
does it reproduce or is it just one entity hopping from host to host? Because if it's the first one, then that's even more scary. Anyways, its method of attack of course is parasitic infections, being a form changing creature believed to be extraterrestrial, though not proven to be true. It was however proven very effective on most subjects, but deemed too difficult to contain. Now was it too difficult to contain, or was it just because the place he chose was an old lab that literally had the power go off every two seconds? That just seems poor planning on your part. Damn though, I am pretty hungry now. I should probably order some Mickey D's. Mickey, Mick, Buh, Buh, Burger? I don't know, I was trying to make a transition and just didn't know how. So room 710 was pretty cool due to us being able to see the next location from the door, which is something this game usually doesn't do, since it tries to surprise us most of the time. Inside this area is this fad food's place, with burgers that are 100% beef. Like most fast food restaurants, this is probably not true. That's the real horror of this part. The first note we find about this place is someone who is nervous about getting the job at this location. At first, this place was going bankrupt, but for some reason, it's been picking up a lot of traction due to business and even start to expand, with more and more people showing up to eat here. Though, they don't trust this place's food, so they decide not to eat anything from here at all. Probably for the best due to the amount of additives they put in these kinds of foods. The next note talks about how the orders are continuously rising, but not the amount of people showing up. Someone ordered a lot of food for themselves, but then 10 minutes later, came back again just to order more food. I think I could tell where this is going to go. We then enter the Roman's restroom. Here we find the third note, where this person tried one of the burgers here and says it wasn't that bad. Because of this, they might have one every so often. Continuing further, there's this ketchup pile next to the key that we need to progress. Of course, it's ketchup, just look at where we are currently, we're in a fast food restaurant. That's where we make it to this place. I don't know what to call it, it's like a playpen for kids to crawl through. I don't know its actual name though. Next to it is this note where the guy who ate the burger is having dreams about the restaurant. More like nightmares from the way he's describing it. The other guy who kept ordering food was getting much worse? Which is when we get to play for a bit in the tunnels. I get what this game was going for since, look we're making a fun place spooky now, woo! But I don't feel as though this really works here. Anyways, the next note we find is about a horrible accident. Not really an accident, because it was on purpose, but when the employees brought in outside food, it's basically the same as a McDonald's employee bringing in Wendy's. It's a major cardinal sin, so that probably deserved capital punishment. <laughs> but the, the manager grabs the employees. <laughs> yeah, you, you can read that yourself. I'm not gonna read that out loud. They were just a tad bit mad, I guess. Just saying, maybe this guy should quit his location. It really doesn't seem like a good fit for you. Continuing forward, like I said, the yellow fog just doesn't work in my opinion. It doesn't make it scary at all. There's this other note we read where this guy is saying he's going to quit, as he should, if only all horror characters were this smart. We get the final key which unlocks the freezer, where the music changes and this happens. Yeah, so this thing was a food demon and it's kind of disappointing. What I find funny though is that it flashes a bunch of things on screen with one of them being red and yellow, which is the same color of a certain franchise. I couldn't really find out what this thing was supposed to be inspired by, but honestly, I don't think it was really inspired by anything since it was just a stereotypical demon with its horns and red skin. Though the empty black eyes with the black tears going on its face was the only part that I truly liked about it. Everything else just felt boring to me. Even the whole voice lines being reversed wasn't that scary either. Maybe his death screen will be better. Ah, uh, well. How do I describe this? The Dear Lord felt menacing because of its design and how it felt like there was no choice but to accept your fate. 
The food demon wants to do the same concept, but it ultimately falls extremely flat on its face. Due to him, one, as a concept and design, aren't really that scary all by themselves, and two, the location being ugly and bland. I'm guessing the walls are supposed to be rotting beef or rusted metal, but either way, this is nowhere near the fear you would have felt with the Deer Lord. It's just so boring, and even at the end with the binary code and the text, it's just headache inducing? I feel as though design wise and introduction wise, this is one of the weaker characters in the whole game. Even the gel monster had a better introduction and all he did was show up. Maybe the true fear was the fact that it represented the addictive nature of certain fast food restaurants causing people to constantly- <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you wish. You wish there was some extra meaning, and maybe there was, but you're going to have to stretch far and wide to find that here. He also makes doors disappear, which was annoying. Not really spooky, just actually annoying. His cat Dio West makes his character model look actually more menacing than he actually is? And maybe if they made him black instead of red, this could have been a lot better. Who knows? He made 317 people of re with his method of attack being unknown. I don't know if that's the record right now, I'm too lazy to check, but that seems like a lot of people. He doesn't actually seem to be able to be contained at all, and will just wander around. The important thing we learn is that it's proven not effective as victim souls do not remain after contact. If you couldn't tell, the effectiveness of each specimen is due to how many souls they collect, with this being directly tied to how many people they can, you know. So they want to really collect souls, though the reason is currently unknown. All in all, boring specimen, boring area, boring death scene. Yada yada yada. Before we make it to the next specimen, we get to room 750, where Spooky is so proud of us that they give us a gift of unlimited stamina. Which was something so amazing since we could just run around forever and we no longer can sprint. Technically, she wasn't lying since without being able to sprint, we no longer are able to lower the stamina bar. Thank you so much, Spooky. I definitely enjoy not being able to run away from random specimens that tried to chase me. Though, thankfully, after 10 rooms, this wore off and we could sprint again like normal. Now, room 810 is a mansion, which is the reason why I said technically two specimens, since the mansion itself is what's being used. I really enjoy this location, and I'll go through why. For one, the aesthetics of this location really reminded me of older pixel horror games, where you would need to find a key to unlock a new area while hiding from whatever monster is chasing us down. For instance, this guy holding the scythe is someone we must avoid while exploring this location, and seems to have a bit of a cold due to how raspy his voice is. I hear you. Are you in here? Where are you? Like I said, this is a pretty cool area due to how we have to basically hide from this guy. Other specimens, we were required to be able to outrun them, or at least make it to the next room alive. This change in gameplay was pretty refreshing to see over the whole run faster, lose approach that we've been getting comfortable with. Making it room to room, we will find new keys and eventually unlock new areas. That is, until we find his book. Once we have it, we can unlock this hidden basement, which is this dark underground place that was actually a complete surprise to me. Being almost like amazed since running around, I felt like I was going to have another chase scene soon. Eventually, we get to the final key and finally make it to the exit. Though, my heart dropped when this happened. I have no idea what that was, I'm not sure if that was the old man or something else, I don't want to know, so moving on. Now, inside the mansion, this old man is terrifying as we will need to hide from him when he's close, though outside of it, he's just an NPC to be honest. Not being that fast, and we could just outrun him pretty easily. The death scene is, well, not gonna lie, out of all the still images, this one's probably the most creepy to me for some reason. I don't get it. It's just an old man's face staring at us for a bit before fading to black. No text at all, which is something I would have expected from it. It's just unsettling just seeing him staring at us with his face getting distorted. Smiling. Now, you probably were confused as to why I said this mansion itself was a specimen. Looking at the cat, DOS, it says that 57 people didn't check out, with its method of attack being various different things. 
is an old Victorian mansion with it choosing a host to possess and then use them to attack the other subjects. Not much is known about this place, but it seems that there was some earlier sign of some sort of tragedy taking place within it. Proven very effective, but it varies depending on whether or not it has a reliable method. Guess this old man is more than enough. There was this skull room inside the basement, which was probably what the tragedy was talking about, though almost nothing is known about what actually happened. This is probably one of the better specimens in this game due to its introductions being quite solid, how unique it was, and even its end scene being unsettling. Now for the next specimen. Don't worry, we are almost done with this video. Room 910 kind of threw me off once again. In front of us is this door that is locked shut due to the water level inside of it making us unable to open it. The dark area is pretty hard to see and navigate. That was until we found this lantern. They should really bring back lanterns in games, it really reminded me so much of Amnesia. The Dark Descent. Walking around, we will get these research reports and they're about whales who died due to mysterious reasons. Though we find out that something may have eaten it from the inside out so they're assuming it has to do with a parasite. Haha, <laughs> we already know that we had one of those before, so nope, it's gonna be something completely different. One report has a code to the store, which is what we need to unlock the pump, which is when we're able to finally open the previously locked door. Now, if you played Amnesia before, this location will be pretty familiar to you. And for those who haven't played it, we'll just stick around and see what happens. There are these boxes that we can stand on as we are submerged waist high by the water. Walking around, we do find one final report, saying no matter what we do, don't open that door. Well, we were never smart to begin with, so what do we do? We explore for a bit to find a key and open that door. Yeah, so Ariel is mad that her handsome prince broke up with her, and she's taking it out on you. This gameplay mechanic is heavily inspired by Amnesia's as we need to step on these boxes in order to avoid her and cause her to slow down since she is extremely fast at swimming. This section isn't that difficult as long as you make sure to stick near the boxes and run when you need to. Now the design of the mermaid is something I can't really comment on since they're under the water and don't really have a design at all. But I will say, I do really like the fact that they use a seemingly innocent looking mermaid to lull the player into a false sense of security before having her jump into the water and chasing you. It was fun running around in the water for a bit since the old running into randomly generated pre-made rooms was getting kind of boring after a while, with her design being basically non-existent but having a fun mechanic, how is her munching scene? Uh, It was something? I mean... It was just a face, and then a creepy looking face, and then flashing red lights? Ooga booga, spooky! Yeah, just another really disappointing death scene to be honest. Not much I could really talk about for this section since the introduction area was just meh, and filler content for this mermaid. The chase sequence was pretty fun, but other than that, it was boring. They didn't really do anything cool or unique. I mean, Will's being killed by her, which gave her bad girl points, I guess, but other than that, not really something I got scared by, nor was I invested with this character. The cat DOS about her says she did away with 194 people, which is wow. Considering her method was to drag them under the water, this is impressive. Like, genuinely, since if you think about it, that many people had to fall for her back. Not her face, since you know how that looks, but just her back. Anyways, let's talk about the final specimen and honestly probably the one of the creepiest concepts within this game. Room 1000. This is it. This is the number we need to reach. The exit we were waiting for. Inside of it... Is nothing? Uh... Cute hills and a purple sky, I guess? Your fortitude or your dedication. I'm sorry. 
darkness place, we're walking around in an oddly clean looking area. If this was an area that had ketchup all over the place, then I probably wouldn't have been so terrified. It's as if it's waiting for us to be the mess. We keep walking around until... To say that you were expecting a whole boss battle in a horror game like this would have been surprising. Holy... <laughs> it's such a weird event but the introduction of this thing is so terrifying how it builds itself from only a head? Not to mention how we deal with it? We'll have to dodge various attacks from these bones coming up from the ground, to hands popping up and these shadow looking things coming after us. That's when we need to fire back these orbs at him to hit him when he reaches the ground. Also, quick note, when the skulls do rise up from the ground, we hear screaming, which is honestly horrifying. After a while, we will be able to finally beat him, and the building collapses onto us. Yeah, I don't know what else I should've expected, especially with a game like this. Well, that was a normal, or quote unquote, good ending, since we made it through the game without being a monster. You know how we have this beautiful shiny looking axe? Well, what if we tried to turn it a bit red? There are a couple of enemies that we could basically turn into not happy individuals using this axe. Such as the Violent Deer, Specimen 1, Specimen 2, and various others that are affected by it. Each enemy gives us a certain amount of violence points, and if we reach more than 20 points, we will be able to reach the bad ending after beating the Taker. Congratulations! You did it! It was interesting watching you swing your axe around like that. I know you'll make a fine specimen. In this ending, we become a specimen, which is a pretty cool concept, though a pretty scary one. Were we always the bad guy in this place? The final ending is my favorite since we need to turn off all the specimens in the options and then go to room 1000. So you literally have to beat the game without being chased or scared or even actually doing anything but walk through 1000 rooms. Why would you even do that? But here's what happens. Congratulations, you've done it. You can go home now and if anything changes, uh, we'll let you know. Bye. <laughs> Even Spooky seems disappointed in you because literally why would, why would anyone want to do this? Now, here we are. We beat the game, saw every single specimen, and were able to make it through alive. We did it. Thank you to everyone who watched all the way to the end. It really means a lot since editing this video, it takes a really long time to make. So as a reward, here is the tier list that I came up with. I decided to rank them based on a character as a whole and not just the death screen, since some of them had really bad scenes but a pretty decent character design and story. Obviously, S tier has to be the Dear Lord, the Merchant, and Centipede. I don't really need to explain why they're just amazing. A tier goes to the Wall, the Taker, Bab, and the Old Man. The Wall you really need to think about to be scared of him since he doesn't really have a death scene. The Taker is just cool because he has a boss fight. Bab, it's Bab. And the old man is just creepy. B tier, we got Ringu and the Parasite. I love their location designs, but not their end screen since they're both really disappointing. 
C tier, we got the Food Demon, Gel, and Mermaid. The Gel could get a pass since they were the first character shown, but the other two? Is this really where we're going to be ending things off? Just disappointing, to be honest? D tier is the cardboard cutouts and the deers. Actually, since I had to jump when I first saw these two, since I forgot they existed and a deer caught me off guard, this tier is the not scary, but I got scared because I'm dumped here. Anyways, that is all for this video. I'll be talking about DLC in another video since there's a lot of content within there and my sanity could only take so much from this game. Thank you once again for watching all the way to the end. If you like this video, like and subscribe. Comment down something below, who's your favorite specimen and why? In the meantime, I'm tired for talking for so long, so I'm going to go take a nap. Peace.